Do you smell what the rock is cooking? The rock says. Words are powerful things. They can affect people on an emotional and physical level, sometimes even changing a person's entire outlook. Whether it be a line in a film or TV show, a slogan plastered on a billboard, or even a conversation with a friend or relative, words have the ability to create a lasting impact on society and popular culture as a whole. Sometimes all you have to do is look at a still from a movie and you can hear the line being spoken just because it's become so ingrained in the public consciousness and the same can be said for professional wrestling. Wrestling at its core is a drama with its stories being afforded the unique opportunity to be told through words as well as actions. The ability to weave a compelling tale on the microphones is a huge part of getting fans invested in a storyline and therefore, more importantly, getting them to part with their hard earned money to get into the building and to see the story unfold. The industry's seen its fair share of premier wordsmiths, with promos from decades ago still being referenced to this very day by fans. Such was their impact on them and the business as a whole. So today, we're going to look at some of the most enduring promos in the history of pro wrestling. Now, of course, this is in no way an exhaustive list. It would take literally hundreds of videos to go through every great promo in the history of pro wrestling, so I've chosen a few of my own personal favourites for this video. As always, feel free to leave your best love promos in the comment section and we can come back to this topic later on. He put hard times on Dusty Rhodes and his family. You don't know what hard times are, daddy. The character of the American Dream Dusty Rhodes was one that resonated with blue collar Americans. They saw a little of themselves in Dusty, someone who had to scratch and claw for everything they had and if they worked hard enough, they could become their own success through grit and determination. This was exemplified during Dusty's legendary feud with nature boy Ric Flair, a man who was the exact opposite of the American Dream. Flair's philosophy of money, excess and flamboyance clashed with that of Rhodes, and the two would battle in the ring and on the microphone as they aimed to prove that their way was the right way. To build up to their upcoming clash at Starcade 1985, Dusty would deliver his greatest ever speech on the October 29th 1985 episode of Mid-Atlantic Wrestling, now referred to as the Hard Times promo. Dusty returned to the NWA following some time away after being taken out by Flair. He thanks the fans for their support during his time off as well as thanking Jim Crockett Promotions. Dusty then turned his attention to the World Heavyweight Champion, stating Ric Flair put hard times on Dusty Rhodes and his family by taking the American Dream out of action before telling Flair that he has no idea what hard times are. Hard times are when the textile workers around this country are out of work and got four or five kids and can't pay their wages, can't buy their food. Hard times are when the auto workers are out of work and they tell them go home. And hard times are when a man has worked at a job 30 years, 30 years. They give him a watch, kick him in the butt and say, hey, a computer took your place, daddy. That's hard times. That's hard times. Dusty then says he knows he doesn't look like the athlete of the day, but one thing he is, is a bad man and that world title belongs to the people, the same people that showed Dusty love when the dream was done. Rhodes intends to repay them all by taking the world title from Flair and giving it to the folks watching at home because he came back for them, and for Jim Crockett Sr who, in Dusty's words, never got to see a real world champion. He signs off by saying he's proud of his fans and he loves them all. I'm proud of you and thank God I have you. And I love you. Love you! The American Dream, Dusty Rhodes fans. In just three minutes, Dusty was able to get across his character, the reason why he and Flair were at war, and how the part of the fans coming together, regardless of creed, colour or identity, would be the thing that would help him take back the world title from the arrogant and entitled nature boy. Whilst Dusty had a catalogue of legendary interviews, there is no doubt that the Hard Times promo is his masterpiece, standing as one of the business's most timeless and endearing promos. Steve Austin's time has come, and when I get the shot, you're looking at the next WWF Champion. It's rather fitting that arguably the biggest star in the history of pro wrestling came up with the most iconic line in the history of pro wrestling. While he would go on to have a Hall of Fame career, in 1996, Steve Austin was going through a transitional stage, going from the ringmaster persona to the embryonic stages of what would become Stone Cold. 
Following his victory in the 1996 King of the Ring, Austin was invited by Doc Hendricks to give his thoughts on his achievements throughout the tournament and Austin duly obliged. The first line of his now legendary promo emphasizing that he had gone from a mute technical wrestler to a no-nonsense ass kicker who would say whatever he wanted. The first thing I want to be done is to get that piece of crap out of my oh, ring. Come on. He would go on to mock his opponent, Jake the Snake Roberts, and say how his time was over and despite saying his prayers and thumping his bible, it didn't get Jake anywhere. Austin would then proceed to drop a line that would change his life forever. Talk about your psalms, talk about John 316. Austin 316 says I just whipped your ass. Austin then tells Jake to go and get a cheap bottle of Thunderbird to get some of that courage back he had in his prime, making reference to Robert's problems with alcohol in the past before putting the rest of the WWF superstars on notice. I don't give a damn what they are, they're all on the list, and that's Stone Cold's list, and I'm fixing to start running through all of them. Austin finishes his speech by saying that he couldn't care less who the champion is when the time comes, because he will be the next World Wrestling Federation champion. Why? And that's the bottom line, because Stone Cold said so. Looking back on it now, there was no way anyone could have guessed that this promo would not only be the launching pad for what the Stone Cold character would become, but that it would become one of the most enduring and most profitable promos of all time. Before I leave in three weeks with your WWE Championship, I have a lot of things I want to get off my chest. The WWE landscape back in 2011 was very different to what it is today. With the company having seen somewhat of a resurgence in the past few years, it's safe to say that back then the product was in the doldrums, seemingly unwilling to make new stars or push any creative boundaries. So when CM Punk sat cross-legged at the top of the ramp on the June 27th edition of Raw, the reverberations from his words not only shook the wrestling world to its core, but it also got mainstream media once again interested in pro wrestling. No matter your personal feelings on the man, it can't be denied that when Punk grabs a microphone, you pay attention to what he has to say. And on this night in Las Vegas, rather appropriately, Punk rolled the dice and won big with a promo that has gone down in history as the pipe bomb. After costing John Cena a match against R-Truth, Punk took his place on the stage and began to air his grievances against the company, the hierarchy and the fans. He began by saying he had no issue at all with John Cena, in fact he liked John a lot more than many of the folks in the back. What he had an issue with was the idea that John Cena was the best. Because you're not. I'm the best. I'm the best in the world. He then mentions that John is better than him at one thing though, and that's kissing Vince McMahon's ass, before mentioning those who come before John got to the top of the industry by, in his mind, sucking up to the boss. You're as good as kissing Vince's ass as Hulk Hogan was. I don't know if you're as good as Dwayne, though he's a pretty good ass kisser. Always was and still is. After saying how he's breaking the fourth wall and waving directly into the camera, Punk then says he's the best wrestler in the world, emphasizing that he doesn't see himself as a superstar, but as a professional wrestler, and that he's been vilified and hated for it since he walked through the doors of WWE. Punk then mentions a few names that hadn't been discussed on WWE television in quite some time. Paul Heyman saw something in me that nobody else wanted to admit. That's right, I'm a Paul Heyman guy. You know who else was a Paul Heyman guy? Brock Lesnar. And he split, just like I'm splitting, but the biggest difference between me and Brock is I'm going to leave with the WWE Championship. He then talks about grabbing so many of Vince McMahon's imaginary brass rings that he's finally realized that they're just that, completely imaginary, and he says that he's proven that he's unmatched in the ring, on the microphone, and even on commentary. No matter how many times he proves it though, he still doesn't get the respect that he feels he deserves. And yet, no, how many, no matter how many times I prove it, I'm not on your lovely little collector cups, I'm not on the cover of the program, I'm barely promoted, I don't get to be in movies, I'm certainly not on any crappy show on the USA Network. I'm not on the poster WrestleMania, I'm not in the signature that's produced at the start of the show. 
He once again references The Rock, saying that the fact that The Rock's in the main event of WrestleMania next year and Punk isn't makes him sick, before then turning his attention to the fans. Oh, hey, let, let me get something straight. Those of you who are cheering me right now, you are just the biggest part of me leaving as anything else. Because you're the ones that are sipping out of those collector cups right now. You're the ones that buy those programs that my face isn't on the cover of. And then at five in the morning at the airport, you try to shove it in my face so you can get an autograph and try to sell it on eBay because you're too lazy to go get a real job. Punk then makes reference to his WWE Championship match against John Cena in three weeks time, the night where Punk's contract would expire, also saying that after he wins the belt, he'll maybe take it to New Japan Pro Wrestling or even Ring of Honor. He then says, Hey Colt Cabana, how you doing? Which nowadays takes on a whole new perspective given the two men's recent history. He then says that he knows the fans will still pour money into the company despite the state it's currently in, mocking Vince for surrounding himself with Yes Man before dropping what's arguably the most shocking line from this entire promo. And I'd like to think that maybe this company will be better after Vince McMahon's dead, but the fact is, it's, it's gonna get taken over by his idiotic daughter and his doofus son-in-law and the rest of his stupid family. Just before Punk's able to tell a personal story about Vince, his mic gets cut off and the broadcast ends shortly thereafter. Even to this day, the pipe on promo is still mentioned in reverence by fans, saying that it echoed their exact sentiments at the time. Others even said it's what got them back into pro wrestling, such was its impact. Punk may well have cut better promos before and since, but it's the pipe bomb that will be his legacy in the wrestling world. This is my yard now. In stark contrast to Punk's near 10 minute soliloquy, this promo from Roman Reigns lasts all of 3 seconds and it consists of merely 5 words. It was the night after WrestleMania 33, at which Roman Reigns handed The Undertaker only his second ever loss at the Showcase of the Immortals and, simply put, this victory added more fuel to the fire when we consider the fan backlash against Roman during this time period. The company had been pushing Roman as the guy for years at this point and fans had soundly rejected him, yet the company would continue to force the issue which would just create more resentment. This was epitomised on the Raw after WrestleMania, a show that I attended, as the fans chanted their appreciation for The Undertaker, who had left his hat, gloves and jacket in the middle of the ring at WrestleMania, seemingly symbolising his retirement. Just as the fans inside the Amway Center were engaged in back and forth chants of Undertaker and Roman sucks, the big dog's music would hit, forcing the audience to unite in overwhelming boos. Roman would slowly make his way out onto the stage and down the ramp before getting into the ring and grabbing a microphone. He stood in the middle of the ring with a cavalcade of boos and insults raining down on him, and the crowd would not let Roman get a single word out. This would continue for three solid minutes, all whilst Roman looked on with an unwavering expression on his face. Eventually, Roman put the mic to his lips and uttered the words, This is my yard now. He then dropped the mic and left the ring, all to the soundtrack of even louder boos. Nowadays, Roman's capable of cutting fantastic promos as the tribal chief, but back then, his mic work was far from stellar, primarily due to the subpar material he was given to work with. What's so great about this promo is that he was able to encapsulate in five words what most would have taken a hundred to get across. And also, for me personally, it was brilliant being in that crowd the night after WrestleMania 33. You know who I am, but you don't know why I'm here. If you're a viewer of my Reliving the War series, then you'll be more than familiar with this one. Those words from Scott Hall all the way back in 1996 helped lay the groundwork for what would be the biggest boom period in wrestling history. Scott had parted company with the WWF in 1996 and he showed up unannounced on the May 27th episode of WCW Monday Nitro, the rival company of his former employer. During a match between the Mauler and Steve Dahl, Hall came through the crowd, he climbed over the barricade, he grabbed the microphone and entered the ring much to the confusion of fans in attendance. The commentary team were equally as bewildered by the shock appearance as Scott began saying that those in attendance knew who he was, but they didn't know why he was here. 
He then calls out Ted Turner before mocking Macho Man Randy Savage, saying that Scott Hall goes wherever he wants, whenever he wants. And where, oh where, is Scheme Gene? Cause I got a scoop for you. He then lays out a challenge that anyone in WCW before uttering that now iconic line. You want a war? You're gonna get one. It's at this point referee Randy Anderson ushers Scott out of the ring as both the crowd and the commentary team sit in stunned silence. At this point, it seemed like Hall was portraying an invader from WWF, claiming that he was coming to initiate a war between both companies, with many unaware that he was no longer under contract with the World Wrestling Federation. Little did we know that these two minutes of television would start the wheels in motion for the most important and most lucrative era in the history of the business, and its importance really can't be understated. As far as I'm concerned, all this crap in the ring represents these fans out here. On the subject of changing the landscape of pro wrestling, Hulk Hogan's heel turn at the 1996 Bash at the Beach was, up until that point, the most shocking event to take place in the history of the business. Hogan had been the most popular star in the sport for the past two decades, with legions of loyal fans who had propelled the Hulkster to more than just a pro wrestler, he became a cultural icon. So when Hogan was revealed as the third man in Hall and Nash's plot to take over WCW, it shook the wrestling world to its very core. Following his betrayal, Mean Gene Okerlund demanded an explanation, and the Hulkster was more than ready to give him one, cementing his heel turn with his very first line. Me, Gene, the first thing you need to do is to tell these people to shut up if you want to hear what I got to say. Okerlund says he can't believe that Hogan would join forces with Hall and Nash before Hogan explains his motivations along with dropping the name of this group for the first time. Well, the first thing you got to realize, brother, is this right here is the future of wrestling. You can call this the new world order of wrestling brother hogan then references that organization up north and says that no one knows more about that organization than he does he says that he was the one who made that company a monster the one who made those who ran that company rich but hulk hogan became bigger than that organization and hogan then brings up ted turner and then billionaire ted amigo he wanted to talk turkey with Hulk Hogan. Well, Billionaire Ted promised me movies, brother. Billionaire Ted promised me millions of dollars. And Billionaire Ted promised me world caliber matches. And as far as Billionaire Ted goes, Eric Bischoff and the whole WCW goes, I'm bored, brother. That's why these two guys here, the so-called outsiders, these are the men I want as my friends. Mean Gene then points out all the trash that's been thrown into the ring by fans in attendance, to which Hogan responds. As far as I'm concerned, all this crap in the ring represents these fans out here. He mentions that for the past two years he did all the charity work, but after the reception he got from fans for doing all that, the fans can stick it. If it wasn't for Hulk Hogan, you people wouldn't be here. If it wasn't for Hulk Hogan, Eric Bischoff would be still selling meat from a truck in Minneapolis. And if it wasn't for Hulk Hogan, all these Johnny Come Lately's that you see out here wrestling wouldn't be here. Hogan once again emphasizes that this new group will dominate the world of wrestling before asking the question. What you gonna do when the new world organization runs wild on you? Once the promo wraps up, the broadcast goes off the air with Tony Schiavone saying that Hulk Hogan can go straight to hell. There isn't a wrestling fan that hasn't seen this promo at least a hundred times, but the impact it has never diminishes. Despite Hogan cutting more famous promos throughout his career, this is unquestionably his best work on the mic. Oh my god, anybody buy
but the rock. Know your role and shut your mouth. Say what you want about Dwayne Johnson, but in his prime, The Rock was one of the most charismatic and entertaining superstars in the history of the business. He had so many memorable segments and catchphrases, so much so that the WWE even named one of their television programs after one of those phrases. The Rock was always able to laugh at his opponent's expense, and none more so than his exchange with the 1999 King of the Ring winner, Badass Billy Gunn, on the July 11th 1999 episode of Sunday Night Heat. The most electrified man in sports entertainment made his way down to the ring to his usual raucous reception before talking about his situation with current rival Triple H and their upcoming bout at Fully Loaded. Rock then turns his attention to Billy Gunn. He says the night Billy won the King of the Ring tournament, Mr. Ass got down on his hands and knees and he said a prayer that went something like this. Oh dear God. You see, my name's Billy. And I just won King of the Ring, but there's one problem. Everybody still thinks that I absolutely suck. After that, his house began to shake and God himself spoke to Billy Gunn. Bob? But my name's Billy. It doesn't matter what your name is. Rock then says God told Billy to find the man who's simply electrifying. He must go and find the rock. Oh, but God, anybody but the rock. Know your role and shut your mouth. Just then, according to the rock, the fear went through Billy's body. Tears rolled down his cheeks and piss rolled down his leg as the clouds parted once again to reveal millions and millions of voices saying in unison. Jabroni, if you smell what the rock. Is cooking. Mr. Ass did have a rebuttal, no pun intended, but it didn't have a patch on what Rocky had just said. If ever there was a promo that encapsulated the character of The Rock, this would be it. In just a matter of minutes, anyone would be able to understand who this man was, what his attitude was towards his opponents, and why he was universally adored by millions and millions of fans worldwide. Some even say that this promo destroyed Billy Gunn's solo push. American fans treat me across the United States of America, I feel like I lost. Bret Hart is one of, if not the, greatest in-ring talents the business has ever seen. A smooth, technical master who had the ability to tell a story with nothing more than the moves he would perform in between the ropes. However, even Brett admits that cutting promos was never exactly his strong suit. That being said, the night after his now legendary match with Stone Cold Steve Austin at WrestleMania 13, Brett came down to the ring to air his grievances about how the fans seemingly turned their backs on him and decided to side with his opponent. Upon taking the mic from JR, Brett apologizes for his actions following last night's bout to all his fans around the world, especially those in Canada, although there is one set of fans that he feels differently about. And to you, my fans right here across the United States of America, to you, I apologize for nothing. Brett then says no matter how many wins he gets across the United States, he still feels like he's lost. You know, I find myself, no matter how much I win, when I walk back to the dressing room, the way you American fans treat me across the United States of America, I feel like I lost. Brett then brings up the previous year's WrestleMania when he was WWF champion, and he says that instead of cheering for him, the fans decided to support Shawn Michaels, allowing Shawn to screw Brett out of the championship. He mentions that when he was sitting home watching WWF television, something occurred to him. The World Wrestling Federation needs a hero, they need a role model, they need somebody they can look up to. Not somebody. It's got earrings all over himself and tattoos. Brett then says that after saying that, it made him want to come back and clean up the WWF. When he faced Psycho Sid, Sean once again in his mind cost Brett the WWF title and no one did anything about it. So then I found myself stepping in the ring with Psycho Sid and your hero, your pride and joy, Shawn Michaels, cost me the World Wrestling Federation Championship belt. Nobody cared. 
Nobody did anything about it. You people didn't do anything about it. Brad then thought to himself that maybe he should have just quit and gone home, but Vince McMahon begged him not to and to think of the fans. So he did come back with the promise of earning a shot at the WWF title once again, but the fans were more preoccupied with Shawn Michaels forfeiting the title due to a supposed knee injury. You people think that that's just fine. I see everybody crying in the audience for that. You talk about me crying. After winning the championship, Brett mentions that he had to immediately defend it against Sid and that he accepted the match despite being beat up from the final four match. Just when he had Sid in the sharpshooter, all the while being booed by the American fans, he was attacked by Stone Cold Steve Austin. You somehow justify, only in America you can do this, Stone Cold Steve Austin climbs right up on the ring and whacks me over the back of the head with a chair. Somehow. You justify that, that that's okay, that's, that's acceptable in America. Brett then mentions how he was once again screwed out of the title, this time by The Undertaker, and now he's going into the submission match with Stone Cold wanting to give the rattlesnake a good old fashioned ass whipping. And so when I do it, when I actually take that lousy stinking hyena Stone Cold Steve Austin and beat him to a bloody pulp. You somehow find it in your hearts to abandon me and cheer for him. Brett points out that the American fans would seemingly rather cheer for those who do wrong rather than those who do right, and that the fans in the United States don't respect the hitman. So from here on in, the American wrestling fans, coast to coast, can kiss my. It's a universal truth in the world of pro wrestling that the best heels are those who are justified in their grievances, and in this promo, Brett was indeed in the right regarding everything he said. He was screwed over again and again, and no one seemed to care. So when he decided to do onto others what they had done to him, he was rightfully angered when fans turned on him whenever he'd been the victim of the same actions for months on end. Brett also did a fantastic job of summarizing everything that happened over the past few months, and the promo Gets Over Well is a villain's origin story. And they can all kiss my ass! To say that Extreme Championship Wrestling was a game changer would be an understatement. The Blood and Guts promotion out of Philadelphia developed a cult following throughout the 1990s, leading to it becoming the third biggest company in the US with many of its marquee talents going on to have legendary careers. Whilst he isn't mentioned in the same breath as the likes of Raven, Taz, Sabu or the Dudley Boys, it's undeniable that Shane Douglas played a huge role in the success of ECW. This was exemplified by his now infamous promo following a tournament to crown a new NWA World Heavyweight Champion on August 27, 1994 as in ECW's early days, the company was an NWA affiliate. Douglas defeated two Code Scorpio in the tournament finals and he was handed the iconic £10 of gold. And the first thing Douglas did when taking the microphone was he put over Scorpio, saying that he was one hell of a competitor. Shane then says that he stands before God and his father in heaven tonight as world heavyweight champion. He then lists off legends of the business that have held that very championship belt draped over his shoulder. He then looks at the belt declaring how beautiful it is before saying the one line that would define the rest of his career. And Rick Steamboat, and they can all kiss my ass. Sheehan throws the belt down while saying that he refuses to have a torch handed down to him from an organization that died seven years ago. The franchise, Shane Douglas, is the man who ignites the new flame of the sport of professional wrestling. The franchise then grabs the ECW championship before making a bold declaration. I declare myself 
the franchise as the new ECW heavyweight champion of the world. He says that ECW have set out to change the face of professional wrestling and that tonight a new era will begin. So tonight, let the new era begin. The era of the sport of professional wrestling. The era of the franchise. The era of the ECW. The fallout of this promo and the act of Shane throwing the belt down did indeed achieve what he set out to do. NWA board member Dennis Corluzzo was in attendance that night and he had no idea that Shane was going to throw the belt down. Corluzzo was absolutely furious and said that as long as ECW was a member of the NWA, Douglas was the NWA champion and that he would be seeking to strip Shane of both belts. This prompted ECW founder Todd Gordon to end ECW's affiliation with the NWA and in its place would be Extreme Championship Wrestling. In that promo, Shane said he wanted to ignite a new flame and considering what ECW would go on to become, it's fair to say that he accomplished his mission. When you are the king of the WWF, you rule the world! Another man known for his substantial soliloquies, it's quite ironic that Nature Boy Ric Flair's most iconic promo barely lasts two minutes. Renowned as one of the very best in the ring and on the microphone, Flair's unique delivery and cadence when it came to interviews really set him apart from everyone else throughout his legendary career. Despite being deeply associated with the NWA and WCW, Flair made the jump to the World Wrestling Federation in 1991 where he declared himself the real world's champion, even bringing the big gold belt with him to WWF TV. Flair would eventually prove that he was what he said he was after he captured the WWF title by winning the 1992 Royal Rumble, entering the match at number 3. After the Rumble, Flair, Bobby Heenan and Mr. Perfect were interviewed backstage by Mean Gene Okerlund. Let me just say, after view distorting the belt to proclaim me the real world champion, I'm going to tell you all with a tear in my eye. This is the greatest moment in my life. Flair then says, when you tell everyone that you're number one, the only way to prove it is by being number one, and holding the WWF Championship makes you number one. Bobby Heenan then puts over Flair's performance in the Rumble match, with Mr. Perfect chiming in to say he, Flair and Heenan told everyone that Flair was the best. Gene tells someone off screen to put their cigarette out before the Nature Boy finishes his promo in typical Ric Flair style. Now it's Ric Flair and y'all pay homage to the man! Woo! <laughs> Not only is this a fantastic promo on the surface, but it's the content of it that makes it stand out. Flair put himself and his achievement over, but most importantly, he put over the WWF Championship and why it's the most important belt in all of wrestling. Got your hopes up just a little bit, didn't I? On the subject of greatest performers of all time, the Heartbreak Kid Shawn Michaels is another name that has to be considered in that bracket. An outstanding performer from bell to bell, his in-ring ability sometimes overshadowed his ability on the mic, but on the August 15th 2005 episode of Monday Night Raw, Shawn had no problem reminding everyone just how good he could be. This particular episode took place in Montreal, so when Sean's music hit inside the Bell Centre, the boos from the crowd were loud enough to drown out his iconic entrance song. Even though they haven't forgotten what took place 8 years ago, Sean had no problem reminding the Montreal fans why they hate him so much with this opening line. Who's your daddy, Montreal? The crowd immediately respond with chants of you screwed bread and Sean says that since the fans here have been so respectful to him, he would like to return the favour with his own rendition of the Canadian National Anthem. Hulk Hogan right in the face. 
Despite the links to bread, Sean actually has a match with Hulk Hogan coming up at SummerSlam on Sunday, and despite the support that the Hulkster has, Sean has no problem reminding everyone just who he is. But what I am is the showstopper! WWE, yours truly, the heartbreak kid, Shawn Michaels. HBK then guarantees both Hogan and the fans that he'll give them all something to remember at SummerSlam, saying that Montreal knows full well just how much Shawn loves to give people memories. He then mentions Survivor Series, to which the crowd responds with chants of We Want Brett. gonna get Brett because I screwed Brett. Sean then says that if Brett had any guts and if Brett stepped into the ring with him right now, Sean would screw him all over again. Just as he's about to go off on a tirade against the hitman, a familiar song then plays in the arena. Because Brett the hit The fans in the building lose their minds at the prospect of seeing their hero, until it slowly dawns on them that Sean had played each and every one of them. Got your hopes up just a little bit, didn't I? Sean then tells the fans that they'll never see the hitman inside a WWE ring again before turning his attention back to Hogan, saying that he did it to Brett and at SummerSlam he's gonna do it to the Hulkster. He says the Montreal fans hate Sean because he's everything they wish they could be, and that Hogan is the exact same as all of them. Just then, another familiar tune plays inside the Bell Center. What you gonna do, brother? Once again, no one shows up and Sean takes great delight in the fact that he's made a fool of everyone, saying that he's just proved that Montreal is everything that he ever said it was. The fans then start singing hey hey goodbye, so HBK just takes a seat in the middle of the ring and he makes himself comfortable before once again laying into both the Hulkster and the Hitman. Hulk Hogan, the same thing I despise about you is what I despise about Bret Hart. You stood for some moral fiber that in your real life did not exist. Yet you stood in judgment of me. And you, Hulk Hogan, well, you stand for just about anything. There isn't a realistic bone in your body. Sean acknowledges that Hogan is the biggest star the industry has ever seen, and that he wants Hogan to bring everything he has at SummerSlam, all while the fans tell Sean to be quiet in a non-YouTube friendly manner. Yet every one of you Montreal Canadian men do nothing but stand there and talk it while I walk it. Sean ends his incredible monologue by telling Hogan that he's just one move away from his star being snuffed out, and if he doesn't believe him, just ask Brett the Hitman Hart. This was an absolute masterclass in getting the crowd into the palm of your hand and doing whatever you want with them. Sean not only leaned into the response of the crowd, but he used them to make both Brett and Hogan look like cowards so as to put himself over as the better man, all while making the crowd hate him even more than what they already did. Stuff like this is why Shawn Michaels will forever be the showstopper. You see, it was just a matter of time before I bought my competition. On March 26, 2001, Tony Schiavone opened up the final ever episode of Nitro by saying, Welcome to a landmark night in the industry of sports entertainment. What an incredibly prophetic line that would prove to be, as on this night, it was revealed to the wrestling world that Vince McMahon, the owner of WWF, had purchased WCW and that World Championship Wrestling, as we knew it, would now cease to exist. Before the broadcast even began, Vince would appear on TNT to address the WCW fans in a moment that's as surreal as it is significant. Imagine that. Here I am, 
on WCW television. He sarcastically asks those watching at home how this could all be possible before dropping the bombshell on the wrestling world. You see, it was just a matter of time before I, Vince McMahon, bought my competition. That's right, I own WCW. Vince now has the opportunity to address WCW fans as well as the WCW roster and he gives them all a very simple message. Because the fate, the very fate of WCW is in my hands. This promo isn't memorable for how it was delivered or even the verbiage that was used, but because of its importance in the annals of wrestling history, a near five year war was over, signifying the end of wrestling's biggest ever boom period. There were huge levels of uncertainty in the air and this minute long promo was the genesis of a new era in pro wrestling. I'm going to take you back to a very deciding point in my life. A time when I believed in something. Mick Foley is without question one of the greatest talkers in the history of the business. He could captivate an audience merely with a turn of phrase or the tone of his voice and it would be easy to forget that you weren't watching a classically trained thespian but a man who got bashed over the head with steel chairs for a living. Even at this point in his career Foley was regarded as an excellent talker however it was this promo that put him at the very top of the list in regards to being the best promo in the entire industry. Airing on September 19th 1995, Foley stood in front of a single camera backstage and he addressed his rival Tommy Dreamer. He mentions that Tommy's willing to bear the cross of suffering for the ECW fans, to which Foley warns him not to do. Because you see, in order to sacrifice and bear that cross for them, it means I've got to suffer too and I'm telling you from the voice of experience that they're not worth it Tommy. He tells Tommy that he has the choice to apply his trade elsewhere while Foley no longer has that option. He's made his bed of nails and he has no option but to be powerbombed on it. But you see Tommy, the world is smiling at you, the wrestling business is smiling at you and don't you frown back on it! Mick then takes us to a turning point in his life, a time when he thought his name and face made a difference. It was a night where Terry Funk took a bottle and began slicing Mick up. When I saw my saving grace, you see, Tommy, I looked out into that audience, my adoring crowd, and I saw two simple words that changed my life. Kane, Dewey. As Mick focused on that sign, the pain that shot through his body became a distant memory replaced by a pain that will stick in his mind and his heart until the day he dies. Dewey Foley is a three year old boy. You sick sons of bitches! You ripped out my heart! You took everything I believed in and you flushed it down the damn toilet! Mick then begins screaming about how he has to live with the fact that he traded in guaranteed money and comfortable living working for WCW to work for a man who operates out of a piss and pawn shop in Philadelphia. You don't expect me to be bitter. Tommy, when you open up your heart, when you open up your soul and it gets shit on, it tends to make Jack a very mean boy. He tells Tommy to think of his future and that the hardcore life is a blatant lie, as are the letters ECW. That those fans who sit there and say, he's hardcore, he's hardcore, he's hardcore, wouldn't piss on you if you were on fire, you selfish son of a bitch! He emphasizes that the hatred he has inside isn't for Tommy and he just wants what's best for him, but when he heard that WCW called Tommy and the Dreamer turned them down, that made Foley's blood run cold. It's cold as that night in the ECW arena, and so I have got a moral obligation. You see Tommy, I'm on the path of righteousness, and righteous men wield a lot of power. He finishes by telling Tommy to visualize hearing the voice of Eric Bischoff telling him, Welcome home, Tommy Dreamer. 
Remember earlier on when we mentioned that the best heels are those who are justified in their grievances? Well, this promo is the epitome of that. Everything Foley says here is 100% correct. The ECW fans did expect too much, and those willing to go to those lengths were those who would end up suffering in the end. Mick used to be one of those people thinking that the fans would love him for it, but those two words on that sign changed his mindset and now he was on a crusade against the same people he wanted so badly to love him. The intimate nature of this promo makes it even more captivating. A single camera shot with no crowd noise focuses all the attention on Mick and the words he wants to say. Day by day, I have earned my life back! Eddie Guerrero endeared himself to fans with his in-ring ability as well as his overwhelming charm and charisma. However, many also admired his story of redemption, overcoming many demons that plagued him throughout his life. So when Eddie earned a shot at the WWE Championship in 2004, it was a chance for him to prove that he had put those issues well and truly behind him. On the go-home Smackdown before their title match at No Way Out, Brock Lesnar mocked Eddie by bringing out a mariachi band and insulting both Eddie's culture and his past. Eddie stormed the ring and confronted the champion who would continue to berate the challenger, referring to him as an addict. Eddie then tells Brock that he's gonna be straight with him. The truth is, Brock, I am an addict. Eddie recalls how he was carried straight into rehab, but that was just the beginning of a three-year journey that would cost him everything. I disgraced my race, I disgraced my family, and I disgraced myself. But you know what, Brock? I came to a point in my life, I came to a point where it was do or die, Holmes. I had to make a decision. Eddie then talks about how, day by day, he got his life back on track and he earned his way back into the ring which he's standing in right now. He's earned the respect of his kids and he earned his life back. He says he has a new addiction. He's addicted to the high he gets from the fans and the feeling of telling his family that he's overcoming his demons. I'm addicted to the satisfaction that I get to tell everybody like you that didn't believe in me, you can stick it up your ass. Eddie then tells Brog that he knows just as well as Eddie knows what a high it is to be inside the squared circle, and he finishes up by telling Brog how they're both different. See, but the difference between me and you, bro, is that I'm an addict and I'll do anything and run over anybody that it's gonna take to get that around my waist and get my high and no way out and become the WWE Champion Olivato. Watching this back nearly 20 years later still gives me goosebumps. Eddie bared his soul to a worldwide audience and having that level of emotion and passion in his words whilst telling his story, it may well have gone beyond a pro wrestling promo, possibly inspiring others in a similar situation to do what he did and come out on a better side after fighting their own demons. An incredible promo from one of the very best to ever do it. I got a 141 and two thirds chance of winning at Sacrifice. We have had some fairly serious entries throughout this video, so let's end it on a lighter note. Scott Steiner has always been one of those guys you can't help but pay attention to. Whether it be his sheer presence or his otherworldly physique, Big Papa Pump always knew how to turn heads. As entertaining as he was in the ring, it was on the microphone where he would achieve his most memorable feats. Whether it be his unscripted ramblings in WCW or swearing on live pay-per-view in the first sentence he spoke upon returning to WWE, Steiner was always must-see when it came to his promos. When we talk about Steiner on the mic, the promo that he cut in the build-up to his triple threat match for the TNA Championship at Sacrifice 2008 has to be mentioned. Anyone who hears the opening line knows exactly which promo this is. You know, they say all men are created equal, but you look at me and you look at Small Joe and you can see that statement is not true. Scott then breaks down the odds and percentages of how normal competitors fare in various match types, such as having a 50-50 chance in a one-on-one -on -one match. But Scott quite rightly points out that he's a genetic freak and he's not normal. From there, Scott rattles off some mathematics that would make Pythagoras blush. 
See, the three-way at sacrifice, you got a 33 and a third chance of winning. But I, I got a 66 and two-thirds chance of winning because Kurt Angle knows he can't beat me and he's not even going to try. So, Samoa Joe, you take your 33 and a third chance minus my 25% chance, and you got an eight and a third chance of winning at sacrifice. But then you take my 75% chance of winning if we used to go one-on-one -on -one, and then add 66 and two-thirds percents, I got 141 and two-thirds chance of winning at sacrifice. With all of this irrefutable mathematical evidence guaranteeing his victory at sacrifice, Scott ends on a line which just puts the bow on what is a true spectacle of a speech. See, Joe, the numbers don't lie and they spell disaster for you at sacrifice. Now yes, this is a silly promo which on the surface makes very little sense, but it does illustrate the value of comedy in wrestling. There have been many attempts at funny promos over the years, but this one endures in the minds of wrestling fans because it goes beyond regular wrestling comedy and into the realms of the obscure and bizarre, especially coming out of the mouth of someone who looks as intimidating as Scotty Steiner. It's just all so incredibly unexpected. It just goes to show that wrestling truly does have something for everyone. I'm going to have to end this one here because as I said at the beginning, there are literally thousands of promos that could make their way into this video. So much so that I even had to cut a few out that I originally had planned purely because this video has gone on way longer than I originally intended. So honourable mentions go to Paul Heyman's One Night Stand 2006 promo, Triple H's I Am The Game, Mark Henry's fake retirement speech, Eddie Kingston's Tired Of Making Stars progress promo, and Macho Man Randy Savage being the cream of the crop. Let me know in the comment section below what your most memorable promos are, and maybe we'll come back to this topic using only your suggestions. Thanks for sticking this one out, I know it's a bit of a long one, but I do greatly appreciate it and I'll see you all in the next upload. Take care everyone. Are you ready? Think you're a big man. Treat you like you're a little man. Think you're the right